Okay, I'm reducing my message. Okay. Yep. I did see your, I did see your message broke. Um, okay. Just, uh, let me know if you need anything from me. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I know I'm sorry. We just, we don't have any way to get in touch with him. So I think if it gets maybe a couple of minutes past 10, just lock the room and it's, it's, it's their fault, honestly. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you so much. Is it possible? I have a Dr. Hamad coming in. Okay. That, that should be fine. Why don't you let him in? She turned okay. her. Yeah, yeah that, that's him. I moved the IP so I put out chat. Hi, Dr. Ahmad. How are you? Very well, very well. How are you? Well, thank you so much. Okay, thank you for joining. We're just about to get started. So, Trayon, this is our final panelist. Um, so you're able to lock the room after after setup. Thank you very much. Dr. Mahmoud, could you um, unmute yourself? I just want to make sure your audio is clear on our end. Is it clear now? Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Wilson Center. My name is Marissa Khurma, and I'm the director of the Middle East program. We are um, very excited to be launching today's report on women and entrepreneurship in the Middle East and North Africa, um, focused um, on three countries in the region, Bahrain, Lebanon, and Tunisia. Um, we are uh, going to kick this off with um, introductory remarks by our President and CEO, Ambassador Mark Green. Mark. Good morning and thanks, Marissa. Um, I view my role as largely getting out of the way here. You've got some wonderful speakers. Uh, welcome to all of you, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to the Wilson Center. The Wilson Center is a unique institution. We're congressionally chartered, scholarship driven, and fiercely nonpartisan and independent. I am delighted to have this chance to introduce today's launch of our new report, Women and Entrepreneurship in the MENA region, the cases of Bahrain, Lebanon, and Tunisia. As you all know, this is the second report in this series produced by our Middle East program. The first, published in 2020, focused both on the challenges women face in MENA and the integral role women in leadership play in community organizing, mobilizing, and in the economy. Increased economic stresses around the region make this report particularly timely and important. It delves into three countries, as you've heard, Bahrain, Lebanon, and Tunisia, using local and global data to better understand the barriers that women face in accessing the market. While globally, 34% of small and medium-sized businesses are women-owned, it's only 23% in the MENA region, ranging from 7% in Yemen to 49% in Tunisia. Further on, on average, MENA suffers from the world's lowest female business participation, 19%. It ranges from a low of 14% in Bahrain or in Jordan to a high of 43% in Bahrain. Beyond detailing the challenges that women entrepreneurs face, this report highlights the success stories and suggests recommendations for the path forward. Today's discussion will include local and regional experts on the topic. I know their insights will bring important lessons for all of us. But before we get to the report findings, I'd like to welcome our keynote speaker. Ms. Katrina Fotovac is a senior official to the Secretary in the State Department's Office of Global Women's Issues. In this role, she promotes women's, the women's role in peace and security, countering violent extremism, promoting women's economic empowerment, and combating gender-based violence. She has been an advocate for women's rights, human rights, and gender equality throughout her career. She's a leader in this journey and understands both challenges and opportunities that it presents for the U.S. as we look to address these issues globally. Katrina, it is a pleasure to host you at the Wilson Center today. Thank you for your time, and the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Ambassador Green. Your Excellencies, good morning, everyone. Um, as an Iranian American, I have to start off by saying Happy Noruz to everyone. Today is the uh, first day of spring today at 5.24 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, as noted, I am the senior official and acting ambassador at large for the U.S. Department of State's Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues, and I am truly so pleased to be with you all today. I want to first thank the Wilson Center's Middle East program for organizing this event and to acknowledge the time and effort you have put into this report you are launching today and how important this report is. The expertise you provide is so important for informing and focusing our policy efforts in the context of the Middle East and North Africa region. For those of you who are not as familiar with my office, the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues is charged with the mandate of integrating, promoting, and advancing gender equality and the status of women and girls globally through U.S. foreign policy whether that be through our diplomacy, our programs, or our policy. And we do that because gender equality is intrinsically linked with the well-being of all societies. Within the MENA region, women's educational attainment is at par or surpasses men in many countries, with women graduating from universities in STEM fields at higher rates than in the United States and Europe. 
Despite this progress, however, women's labor force participation remains the lowest in the world, averaging 18% across the region. This lags men's labor force participation significantly with a gender gap of about 50 percentage points, creating an environment that really enables women to translate their education into economic opportunities has the potential to substantially boost productivity and income. Estimates suggest that legal and social barriers to women's economic participation in the region result in losses of $575 billion per year. A critical component of supporting women's economic participation is promoting women's entrepreneurship. As with labor force participation, there is a large gender gap in entrepreneurship in the MENA region. According to the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor's most recent report, although 10% of women in the MENA region report startup activity, only 3.2% of women report owning an established business. That's less than half the rate of men's ownership. We know that supporting women's entrepreneurship is good for the entire economy. All boats rise if all uh, rise together. Gender parity and entrepreneurship could add up to $6 trillion in net value to the global economy in one year, particularly as our societies and economies are increasingly reliant on digital technologies. We must ensure that women have access to markets, financing, and networks necessary to create and grow their businesses both on and offline, and to do so safely. At the State Department and throughout the U.S. government, we are placing women's economic security at the heart of our foreign policy. Earlier this year, alongside 11 other federal agencies, we launched the first ever U.S. strategy on global women's economic security. This strategy envisions a world in which all women and girls in all their diversity can fully, meaningfully, and equally contribute to, uh, to and benefit from economic growth and global prosperity. The strategy identifies promoting entrepreneurship and financial and digital inclusion as central to achieving this vision. This priority is supported by the strategies of other three lines of effort. Promoting economic competitiveness and reducing wage gaps, advancing care infrastructure and valuing domestic work, and dismantling systematic barriers. As the MENA region exemplifies, Supporting women's entrepreneurship requires working along these lines of effort together. While this strategy is new, the State Department has already been working in the MENA region and around the world to provide women's entrepreneurship with training, capacity building, digital and financial tools, mentorship, economic resources, in order to foster an enabling environment and improve their access to markets and supply chains. My office provided nearly $50 million of USG contribution to the Women Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative, or WeFi, an initiative backed by $354 million from 14 governments that through, works through multilateral development banks to support women entrepreneurs by scaling up access to financial products, services, building their capacity, and expanding networks offering mentorship, and providing opportunities to link with domestic and global markets. For example, WeFi supported the BRAVE program, Business Resilience Assistance for Value-Adding Entrepreneurship. It is implemented by the Islamic Development Bank and has reached over thousands of women entrepreneurs through training and matching grants to help them strengthen and expand their businesses, even in areas of conflict. Women like Nadia al Abdori owner of Jana's Shop, who provides uniforms to medical professionals. WeFi's BRAVE program helped Nadia adapt and expand her businesses during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, producing much needed personal protective equipment, hiring new staff, and this is all thanks to the matching grants and access to finance. The State Department's Bureau of Near East Affairs also works to improve the capacity of stakeholders to develop policies, regulations, laws, and practices that encourage the recruitment, retention, and promotion of women in the formal economy through the support of Accelerating Women's Inclusion in the Workforce, or the SAWI project. SAWI works in Algeria, Bahrain, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Libya, Morocco, and Tunisia, truly taking a regional approach. We are working hard to support women's entrepreneurs and create an environment which will allow them to succeed and thrive. However, it is the combined efforts of government, research institutions, regional, 
local partners, and the private sector that will allow us to make real and lasting change. Thank you again for having me, and I truly look forward to hearing more about your findings. Thank you so much, Katrina, and thanks for all the work uh, that you and your colleagues do at the State Department um, to promote and advance women's entrepreneurship in the MENA region. Um, I'd like to welcome um, Ambassador Bahrain, Sheikh uh, Talal Khalifa, to give uh, a few remarks as well. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have the support of the Supreme Council for Women in Bahrain for this research and uh, this report, um, and Bahrain has done a lot of work um, to advance women's rights um, and particularly to empower women economically. So, Your Excellency. <coughs> Thank you, Marissa. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be here. Thank you for joining us today, recognizing this work and then appreciating the women in our societies. For it is the realization that the participation of women raises a standard of every aspect of our lives. This realization sets those civilized societies truly apart from the others. And to that point, the work of the Wilson Center will invaluably contribute to this in no small way. Our partnership with the Wilson Center is one based upon an affirmation of the Kingdom of Bahrain's drive towards the further advancement in this field through the scientific analysis of past decisions, the assessment of present challenges, and the clear defining of those areas of opportunities to focus on in the future. Throughout the review of this powerful document, one will realize the multiple ways in which the women of Bahrain are empowered to advance in every aspect of society. For as far back as 2002, with the amendment to our constitution, Bahrain guaranteed equal treatment for all, regardless of gender, origin, language, or faith. In fact, our constitution specifically states that female workers are subject to all provisions governing the employment of male workers without discrimination. It also asserts equal rights and opportunities for all employees, regardless of gender. Although women's advancement has long been on the forefront of my country's national priorities under the leadership of His Majesty King Hamad bin Isa Al Khalifa Bahrain has witnessed aggressive, monumental, and historic reforms, especially in these areas. The establishment of the Supreme Council for Women, headed by none other than Her Royal Highness Princess Sabika bint Ibrahim Al Khalifa, is a testament to the sincerity that my leadership feels towards women advancement in Bahrain. Under Her Royal Highness's stewardship, Bahrain has taken decisive action and made sweeping changes, embracing Bahrain's Economic Vision 2030. The Supreme Council for Women has been able to swiftly affect the country's educational infrastructure, economic ecosystem, and government municipalities by both empowering and protecting women through decisive and supportive measures. These measures are specifically designed to not only or simply empower women, but more precisely to open entrepreneurship and career opportunities, foster financial independence, protect each and every woman's psychological health, assure women's physical well-being, protect them and their children all from domestic violence. One example of how this report points out such efforts is a mention of His Majesty's Royal Decree in, in, 2022, or in 2020 that required employers to give female workers with school-aged children priority for remote work. The enforcement of this decree led to stronger job security and a precipitous rise in women throughout the workforce with as many as 56% of women employed before COVID hit with the number only dropping down 4% after the height of the pandemic. And to, and to allow me just one more indulgence, this work attests to the fact that Bahrain is the only country in the region to enforce open banking regulations, 
making it mandatory for banks to comply. In fact, I'm able to boast the existence of absolutely no legal restrictions on female entrepreneurs in Bahrain. Now that concept might sound unrealistic to those in the United States, but unfortunately, it is all too common in other parts of the world. Such reforms made by His Majesty's government, led by His Royal Highness the Crown Prince and Prime Minister, have only eliminated such barriers, but have increased the support for female entrepreneurship. As pointed out in this document, the percentage of women in our workforce is consistently on the rise, and we shall continue to find ways to increase the percentage of those in senior management based on merit. Just last year, the Central Bank was authorized to lead a charge against this issue, circulating a directive that women's representation on boards of directors and listed companies be revisited. The Wilson Center's report also attests to the fact that as many countries nowadays, women are leading men at all levels of education. As many as 94% of women in Bahrain are graduating from secondary school and 74% of those from tertiary education. Although historically women were predominantly into the fields of early education and nursing, they are now flocking to fields across the academic spectrum, including those under the STEM umbrella as mentioned. So though I tout much of what I stated with great pride for my land and gratitude towards all of those who are working tirelessly to continue to advance women in our society, we fully recognize that there is still work to be done. And it is because of such a realization that I convey such deep and sincere thanks to the Wilson Center. For we not only appreciate this work, but we value what's been presented in this report and realize that it will, without a doubt, assist us in advancing our work to further advance our society for the welfare of all women in Bahrain and the wider region by setting the benchmark, hopefully, for excellence. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, <coughs> excuse me, Your Excellency. Um, just your mention of lifting these legal barriers in the banking system, I think, as, um, as, you, as you said, is very unique. Um, it's because these legal barriers exist in other countries in the MENA region, um, and that's why many women, even when they're lifted, still think that they're unable to access finance. Um, they, they are less confident that they will actually be um, approved for a loan because these barriers have been there for so long. So um, the, the, the technical part is to remove these leg legal barriers and the adaptive part is to perhaps work on women's confidence to also understand that they are able mm -hmm. to access finance. So thank you so much um, once again. Um, we're going to turn to uh, my dear colleague, um, Lynn Munzer, who uh, was our lead researcher for uh, the report. Lynn is um, a global fellow with the Wilson Center, working closely with the Middle East program. Um, and as of two weeks ago, associate <laughs> director um, at our, you know, colleagues across a few streets up, I guess, <laughs> uh, at the Atlantic Council, working on uh, women's issues um, and uh, staying true to your practical and academic research um, in women and the economy. Uh, so Lynn, over to you to share the findings and perhaps a little bit about the methodology, which was very unique um, in the way that we approached the report, so. Thank you, Marissa. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm super pleased about to present to you the findings of the reports. It's been an effort, a, like, an effort between us and the Wilson Center and the Supreme Court to try and to actually create a new way to look at women entrepreneurship. So I'll start. I start with the. Uh, I'll start with the methodology. Our study we utilized Gates Foundation Women Economic Empowerment Model to examine the barriers to women women entrepreneurship in three countries: Bahrain, Lebanon, and Tunisia. We collected data on 
yes, it's a different m model, it's a different method we did it. So we tr try to expand our view into what are the barriers that women face. Let's talk, let's dig deeper. Let's just focus on entrepreneurship. What are the social, economic, and legal elements that affecting are affecting women? So we collected data on key figures and indicators related to women economic empowerment, supplemented by a lot of interviews, a lot of interviews, and a uh, literature review. Our findings reveal many improvements, as your highness just mentioned, in the condition of women uh, entrepreneurs and women in general in the, in the Middle East. Yet, unfortunately, we still face a lot of challenges. These challenges, they span across two main pillars, the fundamental enablers and the opportunity and uh, inclusion. We also found that the countries tend to, be ma to, to make progress in fundamental enablers before addressing any type of opportunity and inclusion. So let's start with the fundamental enablers. They are, let's look at them as um, they are the crucial for creating a supportive environment for women entrepreneurs. Um, our sh study shows significant progress in education. That's the first thing, it's major. Women literacy rates has increased and gender gaps has closed in secondary and university levels. So women are actually more educated than men at this rate. However, unfortunately, despite this high number of educated women, their entrepreneurial and labor force participation remains below the global average, which this can be attributed, what we found it attributed to outdated curricula, sociocultural factors, and lack of focus on entrepreneurship in, in developing entrepreneurship skills or entrepreneurial skills for women in the region. In terms of legal rights, the 2022, they have a 2023, but we, we focus on the 2022 Women Business and Law Report by the World Bank, shows progress in implementing reforms to protect women's rights in these three countries. A lot has changed. A lot of work still has to be done. Some strides has been made in, for example, criminalizing uh, workplace harassment. However, prevention methods and implementation mechanism remain inadequate. I'll give you an example. The definition of sexual harassment in Tunisia is very limited in scope. It established that sexual harassment is only a repeated action. Let just let, let that sink in for a second. So women also still face uh, discrimination, uh, they earn less than men uh, for the same job, and they experience all sort of biases in hiring practices. Bahraini government, they already established resolution in against wage discrimination in 2020, it was great. We still, s in practice, we still, fe still see there is a lack of parity, mostly in the private sector, less in the public sector. That's just the mm -hmm. truth, yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, um, the current legal frameworks often lack clear mechanism of implementation and punishment, which result in slow progress towards equitable labor market participation. Regarding mobility, we talked about this. Um, although there's no legal barriers to mobility, again, great movement, great accomplishment, the cultural norms, and in Lebanon and Tunisia, the inadequate public transportation system still hinder women's full economic participation. Unreliable, unsafe public transportation systems, especially again to in Lebanon and Tunisia, they make it challenging for women to access services outside their communities, or even if they make them vulnerable to harassment. Now, moving to the second pillar, national <laughs> uh, let's talk about opportunity and inclusion. We found that women's entrepreneurial pursuits are hindered by a combination of legal, social, normative, and market-driven market constraints. For workplace participation of women is limited in several factors, including high rate of unemployment, gender biases, stereotypes, and burden of unpaid care work. Women in the three countries perceive the unequal distribution of care and responsibility and lack of adequate childcare as a major obstacle in operating their own businesses. Former employment opportunity are also limited. Additionally, informal employment is a significant issue. 
For example, in Lebanon, more than half of the women are working in unregistered businesses or even don't have their businesses registered in the first place. As for digital inclusion, it varies across the three countries. Bahrain has shown massive progress in digital inclusion. The gender gap in access to internet is only 1.1%. I think you'll appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> However, Lebanon and Tunisia, they still lag behind with, access, um, with an inadequate, inadequate infrastructure, insufficient government effort to promote any kind of digital literacy, and limited support for women in STEM. Financial inclusion is another <coughs> challenge. Despite all the uh, legal equality in terms of opening bank accounts, of obtaining credits, women continue to face discrimination and other gender-specific challenges in access, accessing these services. Besides the cultural barriers and the norms that they, they've been used to, there's much more to it. Bahrain made significant strides in promoting financial inclusion. They're the second in the region, honestly. They add there is no actual evidence of the extent of the use of the financial services, as you mentioned, where only 9% of women borrowed from financial institutions compared to 21% of men. So the three main reasons we observed were low incomes, the fact that someone else in the family has an account, so they felt they don't need to do it, and finally, financial institution perceiving women customers as risky that's one of the findings, especially from Tunisia. In terms of prop property and assets, we have the cultural, religious, and traditional practices. They perpetuate gender-based discrimination. Women have restricted access to land ownership. In Lebanon, only 9% of the like only 9% of the land are owned by women, and they are mostly the, the one who work in the agriculture sector. We also found that the problem arises when executors of the inheritance, usually the male member of the family, do not follow the law and refuse to give women their inheritance that they are legally entitled to. Finally, entrepreneurship. How does this all wrap up into entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship is a very complex issue. Not so complex, but a bit complex. Strides has been made in implementing strategies and initiatives to improve the situation of women. The translation of entrepreneurial intentions into actual business remains limited. I would, I'm going deeper into these elements uh, of the, the challenges for women entrepreneurs in the region, in these three countries specifically. They're similar across countries, this is why we chose them. Venture capital funding gap. In 2021, less than 1% of the $3 billion VC money invested in the region went to women-founded businesses. So it's only 1% of $3 billion. A significant contributing factor to this gap is lack of diversity in the VC. Based on the interviews we had with women, uh, with women entrepreneurs, they faced an uphill battle when pitching their idea to male-dominated panels who may not even fully understand or appreciate the, the female-oriented product or services they're pitching. Mm -hmm. Second, the legal and cultural constraints. For example, discriminatory inheritance laws, they leave women with limited, sometimes with no land or assets registered to their own names, making it difficult for them to secure loans because since they don't have any collateral. Mm -hmm. Three, financial obligation. A lot of countries facilitated uh, financial uh, access for women entrepreneurs, like in Bahrain. But the funding falls short in sustaining their businesses, which means they were able to collect, to get the proper funding to start a business. But growing their business, that's where the problem starts. And this is where why we see less, less women growing their businesses or even sustaining a business in the first place. Uh, in Tunisia, the <coughs> financial institution, they do not recognize women-owned SMEs as a separate segment. Mm -hmm. And so, which it creates a different, totally different kind of challenges in securing finance, funding, sorry. Four, class system and discrimination. Women entrepreneurs, they face discrimination based on their social class and political affiliation. 
still so that hinders their access to funds or resources. In Lebanon, women still face discrimi discrimination based on their social group and connections. I'm Lebanese, I've faced that, so I'm speaking of <laughs> from experience. Five, stereotypes and preconceptions. Societal expectation about the roles and capabilities of women can limit their opportunity from for starting and growing a business. Women entrepreneurs, they lack visibility and role models, which further aggravate the issue. You cannot be what you cannot see. That's six. Skill development. We've mm -hmm. talked about confidence and all the digital and soft skills that they need to enter the market. Uh, ex the existing targeted, uh, the existing programs, they, that are targeted for women entrepreneurs, they are very small and lack focus. They do not address major obstacles such as childcare, such as mobility, connectivity, which are crucial to sustain your business or even start a business. Seven, experience. Gaining relevant experience in the fields where women wish to establish their business is <coughs> always challenging. Your Highness, you mentioned like lack of uh, like high number of women entrepreneurs or women in the labor force now in, in Bahrain. However, they want to enter different fields to help them like STEM fields, but they feel they're still male dominated. So they're afraid of entering. There is fear among women in ent entering these fields. Finally, data availability. There is a lack of up-to-date and comprehensive data on the status of women in, in business in the region. The gaps makes it very challenging to assess the actual progress and the impact of the initiative that's been taking places. I'm gonna wrap it up. Mm -hmm. the, the three countries have experienced, ha we, we examined like have, have their experiences and um, how women entrepreneurs are, the, the challenges they're facing. This grows, the growth in importance and the legal system that hasn't translated in a rise uh, in female entrepreneurship. We have identified all these challenges and we, are, we have provided recommendation. I'm gonna mention four recommendations, I'm not gonna take longer. First, improving the financial inclusion should be a priority. Government and financial institutions should adopt gender sensitive lending practices, encourage diversification of venture capital firms and remove any barriers that hinder women from accessing loans. Second, investing in women's skills and network. Government and NGOs should develop targeted training that cater to the unique needs of women entrepreneurs. And we should also foster a, net foster a network and mentorship opportunity for these women. Third, legal reforms. They must be enacted to support women labor force participation and entrepreneurship. These reforms should address the discriminatory laws, promote gender equality, equality, and ensure that women have full access, or equal access to their rights and opportunities in the workplace and funding. Fourth, developing clear metrics to measure progress. Efforts should be made to collect and disseminate up-to-date comprehensive data on the status of women in business. This allows the stakeholders to make informed decision, assess the effectiveness of their initiatives, and track any progress. In conclusion, I would say government, NGOs, private sector, uh, civil society should all work together to create an enabling environment for women entrepreneurs, addressing not only the legal and the financial barriers, but also the social, cultural, and normative constraints that they're facing. Achieving uh, gender equality and empowering women in the region is complex and multifaceted challenges, but I think we're on the right track. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you for ending on a positive note. <laughs> um, we, we will turn to discussing more um, some of the uh, best practices that we highlighted in the report, uh, but I want to first introduce other members of the panel. Um, and to my left, who's with us today, is Mary Claire Roche, who is Director of Technology at the Arab Barometer. Um, and Arab Barometer has been doing um, really good work um, tracking perceptions of um, uh, the Arab public on where uh, women stand, whether it's women's economic participation or leadership. So we look forward 
uh, to, to your contributions, Mary Claire. Um, and then online, we have Dr. Faisal Hamad, who is Assistant um, Undersecretary for Competitiveness and Economic Indicators, but also the Chairman of the Equal Opportunities Committee at the Ministry of Finance and the National Economy. Um, and um, I just want to say I love the fact that there is such a committee at the, at the Ministry of <laughs> Economy. I think this is uh, very telling of uh, where Bahrain is, uh, is at. Um, and um, last but not least, Lama Musawi, who is the director of Sybil at the American University of Beirut, also an associate professor there. Um, and speaking of indicators, I know that um, um, Lama, you will also talk about um, uh, Sybil and basically how um, you started tracking uh, metrics um, in the private sector uh, and women, uh, women um, businesses. Um, so Mary Claire, I'm going to turn to you first to, I guess, tackle one thing that um, uh, Lynn mentioned and we've seen in other reports, which is the perceptions issue, uh, which I guess is directly linked to the socio-cultural um, or social norms mm -hmm. factor. Mm -hmm. Um, what does the Arab barometer um, tell us about um, not just the countries that we've focused on, but across the board, across the Arab world? Sure. So just a little more context, as Marissa mentioned, uh, Arab barometer is the largest uh, repository of publicly available opinion data on North Africa and the Middle East. So if you're interested in learning more about public opinions, you can all our data is public and available for anyone to access. Um, we did spend some time in our latest survey, which took place from 2021 to 2022, um, where we surveyed 12 countries and we spent time asking what are the barriers women face. Um, we asked about transportation, we asked about skills, um, separation of genders at work, and what we really found was these, um, I tend to classify them as structural versus cultural mm -hmm. barriers. Uh, structural being uh, issues that are more easily addressed by policy preferences. Obviously, these are very intertwined, but we did find that lack of childcare was the number one um, concern of the women and, and men, men did recognize that childcare uh, is important, but women, I don't think men realize how important mm. it is to women. Mm. Uh, and this is true for both women that identify as housewives and women who are identify as employed or self-employed. So we ask those, th those three options are mutually exclusive so we can really see how women see themselves. And the lack of childcare and low wages were really um, the most commonly cited barriers. And more cultural uh, barriers, barriers that are harder for policy to change because they're more internalized, uh, like preference for hiring men, um, or you know, it's socially under undesirable to go to work as a woman. Those were less commonly cited uh, in countries that had a higher agreement that men and women should be separated at work or that the man should have the final say in all family decisions, those we see in those countries, we also see uh, people saying that, oh, it's these, these cultural barriers. Mm -hmm. But across the region, um, it really can't be underemphasized how important childcare mm -hmm. is to uh, women feeling empowered to to work, and and what you mentioned in terms of um, I guess biases in hiring um, are is very much linked to childcare mm -hmm. because the perception is that well if I hire a woman and she gets married then she will take maternity leave she will have children and she most likely will leave that position mm -hmm. and so they so I guess a lot of um, and that's primarily in the private sector because the public sector tends to be a bit more flexible mm -hmm. um, and we've seen, uh, we've included some of that data um, in the report. Um, Dr. Faisal, um, I'd like to bring you into the conversation to talk to us a little bit about some of the findings that you um, heard um, and perhaps tell us a little bit more about what the Equal Opportunities Committee does. Um, I guess, um, does it address 
some of these challenges in terms of biases in hiring uh, and uh, inequality of wages, particularly in the private sector where it's more predominant. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, opportunity to discuss um, uh, the Equal Opportunity Committee uh, in, uh, in the Ministry of Finance and National Economy. Just, just to let you know, these Equal Opportunity Committees are not just in the Ministry of Finance and National Economy. They are across all government entities, as well as uh, a majority of uh, private sector um, uh, entities. With the push of the Supreme Council for Women, now uh, more and more uh, entities are uh, are creating these uh, uh, these committees within uh, within their entities, which gives comfort to uh, uh, women and try to increase the inclusion of women in the in the uh, in the workforce, in particular in the private sector, because as as the data says, the private sector is a bit lagging when it comes to the inclusion of women in the workforce. What these committees do is to try to align the uh, policies, align uh, um, uh, the, met the methodologies and the procedures within each entity to ensure that men and women have equal rights and equal opportunities um, in the workforce. And uh, Bahrain has done uh, uh, has been quite progressive when it comes to uh, uh, stating uh, laws and regulations that ensure equal opportunity um, uh, amongst people without any discrimination when it comes to sex. So uh, in uh, 2021, Bahrain repealed the provisions in the labor law that restrict women from working at night or uh, and in certain industries and introduce amendments uh, mandating equal remuneration for work uh, for equal pay, for equal value. As well as uh, uh, the uh, Bahraini labor law also uh, prohibited the dismissal of female workers uh, during maternity leave, uh, and it specifies full pay of 60 days for women, and they are entitled for up to 15 days without pay. As well as when they come back to work, uh, mothers are eligible for two hours of breast, uh, breastfeeding uh, break each day until their child is uh, of two years, uh, two years of age uh, without any wage reduction. These committees make sure that, um, that people uh, in these, uh, these entities and these industries have equal opportunities when it comes to promotion, as well as when it comes to uh, uh, training and uh, upskilling uh, opportunities. And, and thank you for mentioning the promotion piece because this is one of the challenges, um, including in the public sector, that uh, yes, women are employed, um, but there's always hesitation also from women themselves to take higher positions because of all of these other responsibilities and perhaps the lack of that support network, whether internally, where, wherever you are at the a specific institution or um, um, or at large in, in society, when they say it takes a village, um, it absolutely takes a village <laughs> as, a, as a working mom of two toddlers um, under three. <laughs> um, so um, Lama, I want to turn to you um, to tell us a little bit about some of your findings at Sybil, because you um, basically zoomed into women in business um, in the MENA region, and um, the metrics and the data you have is quite unique. So um, how does it relate to some of the findings that, uh, that Lynn shared? Uh, I think you're muted, if you can kindly unmute yourself. Yes, sorry about that. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today and to share some of the findings um, um, with, uh, with all of you. Uh, so uh, at Sibyl, the Center for Inclusive Business and Leadership for Women, we worked on initiatives to, um, uh, to collect data, to close the, the data deficit in the MENA region uh, through generous uh, funding from the Middle East Partnership Initiative in the uh, United States State Department. We worked on developing uh, two indices, uh, the uh, KIP, the Knowledge is Power Index, which is a sector-based measure of women inclusive human resource policies and practices in local um, uh, employers or local uh, organizations in the MENA region. Uh, the KIP index measures 
uh, and tracks local employer policies and practices regarding uh, recruitment, retention, and promotion of women across sectors. Um, and um, uh, we, uh, we've launched uh, two iterations of this index. The objective is to uh, measure women uh, measure the uh, upon employer policies and practices in terms of how inclusive uh, they are and um, uh, and track uh, this uh, progress over time so we launched the um, uh, to to the first iteration of the kip index and we finished and we are about to launch the second iteration of the kip index all in all we collected uh, a primary data survey data from about 3000 employers um, uh, across the eight countries in the region, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, Bahrain, Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, Libra, Libya, and Kuwait. Uh, we also um, uh, uh, launched the lived experience index, which mirrors the, the KIP index. Um, the lived experience index uh, includes data that uh, measures women's lived experiences um, uh, uh, of uh, recruitment, retention, and promotion across the uh, six sectors um, uh, in the MENA region. The six sectors we've looked at are education, financial services, STEM, healthcare, professional services, and other services. Uh, we um, measured the relative differences between sectors and between uh, countries and between country groupings. So we've classified the, we categorized countries into three groupings. We have the um, resource-rich labor abundant grouping, which includes Yemen, Iraq, Libya, and Algeria. We have the second grouping, which is, uh, which in, which is the resource-poor labor abundant grouping, and inclu it includes Lebanon, Jordan, Tunisia, and Morocco. And the third is the re resource-rich labor importing grouping, at it, and it includes Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Kuwait. Um, uh, results indicate that uh, uh, overall there is a, a distinct lack of formal policies or procedures um, uh, on anti-discrimination or anti-sexual harassment, as well as policies for equitable hiring. Uh, there was also a severe lack of any mechanisms for enforcing uh, retention and recruitment policies across all sectors. While many organizations reported providing career development opportunities for women at similar rates to men and similar rates of promotion, uh, there was inadequate representation of women at the, at the high levels of employment, meaning executives, board of directors, CEO, or, or uh, other uh, top decision-making positions. Um, our findings also indicate um, um, uh, our finding, findings from the second iteration of the index indicate that the, um, um, the um, highest ranked dimension is uh, retention, um, while um, uh, promotion uh, scored the lowest. Um, also, uh, um, uh, education performed the highest among uh, all uh, sectors, whereas STEM uh, performed consistently the lowest, uh, it ranked the, the lowest in the KIP index uh, in each of the three dimensions, recruitment, retention, and, and promotion. Um, uh, the, the low scores are driven by, by poor representation of women at all levels. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, so, so we, we looked at several indicators under recruitment we looked at uh, uh, hiring, meaning the proportion of employees who are females hired. Um, we looked at policies, um, uh, policies focusing on hiring female nationals. Under retention, we looked at uh, representation or the proportion of women across organizations, across the organization. We looked at the tenure, uh, which is the relative st time spent in a position relative to men. We looked at recognition or the proportion of women who received formal recognition. We looked at policies, including anti-discrimination and anti-harassment policies, and how uh, to, to what extent they are informed, enforced. Uh, and under the promotion dimension, we looked at proportion of women in decision-making roles. We looked at proportion of women receiving career development and training opportunities. And we looked at the proportion of women promoted relative to men. 
so there was consistent, uh, the, the findings were consistent, especially in the uh, three, uh, if we zoom in uh, uh, at the three countries, um, uh, Tunisia, Lebanon, and Bahrain, that uh, Lynn uh, reported on, we can see consistently that the lowest indicators um, uh, include uh, policy, retention policies, uh, a representation of women in decision-making roles, um, and um, uh, recruitment policies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lama. Um, one thing I want to turn to, um, uh, going back to one of the findings that Lynn mentioned, um, is on networks. Um, in many conversations that you had, Lynn, with, the, um, with women entrepreneurs across the three countries in particular, uh, and on some of the panel discussions that we hosted, there was a lot about the importance of networks, when the lack of networks was considered a challenge, and when, when people shared some of their successes or ingredients for success, they mentioned the importance of a, you know, a female um, entrepreneurial network. Um, so this is a question to all of you. Um, the, the MENA region is unfortunately the least economically integrated region um, in the world. Um, and, um, and it's unfortunate, mm -hmm. uh, particularly when we're looking at the Arab world because they share one language. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, that should facilitate uh, many of the trade uh, policies. But that is where we're at. So how can entrepreneurship perhaps um, play a constructive role in um, connecting and bridging that gap that we see in trade and economic um, cooperation? Um, I'll turn to you, Lynn, first. Sure. Great question. And yes, <coughs> networking is important. Um, we learn from other people's mistakes instead of doing them. And that's one of the... Uh, feedback I got from women entrepreneurs who were able to, to access a very small network. So uh, how do we, how do they, having a network of women entrepreneurs across the region help the economy, even the trade economy among countries? Well, they want to expand. I think the countries are small enough for them. They need to expand to the whole region. We speak the same language. We have the same uh, cultural uh, habits and interests as well to a certain extent, and their product can live in other countries. So creating a network of women entrepreneurs across the region help them communicate and share experiences, help them benefit the economy where they're going to start trading among each other, filling gaps with whatever they have. So if, for example, you're producing, um, I don't know, uh, this plastic bottle, and you need a cap, and I have it, and mm -hmm. I'm in a different country. You're Jordanian, I'm Lebanese. We can create this and create a different dynamic and change the whole system. Mm -hmm. So one part of it is having the networks. Second part of it is having easier trade system among the countries to make it easier for women to, uh, to, to like exchange to, to, for uh, import-export. It's not always easy all over the region. Mm -hmm. I know in Lebanon it's getting more and more difficult nowadays. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, I hope, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does, absolutely. <laughs> I think those I are keep talking. <laughs> two very, very good points. Um, uh, Mary Claire? Sure, I do think, um, <coughs> you know, as, as much as you say the countries are connected and share certain, uh, share language, share culture, there is a wide variety of challenges mm -hmm. then that really, um, are unique to each country. So I do think the more um, the more people communicate and establish a network, for example, we keep talking about the importance of education. Uh, one question we ask is what is the biggest issue with the schooling system? And those answers really, the top choice really varies by country. Mm. So that is something that, you know, as people get together, you can address these different challenges and say, oh, this is a challenge we've faced. There's too many schools. There's overcrowding. Other people can, uh, other countries can step in. Other women who have, mm -hmm. you know, are trying to develop it, skills and say, well, this is how we funded this. This is how we approached it. Um, so I, I really think, uh, yeah, establishing a network, establishing greater communication helps um, because even though they face, even though people face different challenges, uh, there can be common solutions. 
Yeah, so cross-pollinating across and I guess capitalizing on some of these good, um, uh, some of these differences. Um, and um, uh, Dr. Faisal, um, how do you think networks can help unlock, uh, or how do you think entrepreneurship can help, I guess, establish more networks and um, uh, facilitate uh, uh, trade and economic uh, cooperation? Um, I, we believe in Bahrain that uh, giving women the opportunity to uh, uh, to open up their own businesses and become entrepreneurs is going to give them more freedom and control over their livelihoods. So if they uh, choose not to work in a private sector or choose not to work in a public sector, they always have uh, their way in the uh, uh, when they open up their own businesses. And as as seen by the evidence and by the statistics that we that we that was just shared, uh, forty three percent of uh, commercial licenses uh, in, uh, in in Bahrain are held by women. So that's uh, that's a good indication that there is. Um, thirst for women to uh, jump into this uh, entrepreneurial uh, endeavors. And uh, we uh, actually, it's encouraged not just for uh, for women, it's actually encouraged both men and women to, in, uh, to, uh, to engage in these entrepreneurial uh, endeavors because we believe that through entrepreneurship, through small businesses and medium businesses, any economy can thrive. And uh, women, uh, one, once women enter any uh, any sector, in, uh, whether it's in uh, technology, whether it's in uh, fashion, you name it, they always have uh, an added touch, an added value that's all uh, that's always missing. And we, when we see women representation on boards as well as in management, we can see the changes. In, uh, uh, that they employ or that they add to uh, to the value, and we can see the um, the increased level of sat you know, employee satisfaction. We have a lot of case studies where uh, we we monitored uh, medium and big businesses uh, and even small businesses where it the manager was or the owner was a woman, and we can see the differences in the productivity. We can see the differences in the level of employee satisfaction. So once we in, we add, we let more uh, women enter this, uh, the, this, we can see a huge jump in the productivity as well as the profitability of any business. And um, I, I guess my only request to you, Dr. Faisal, is to actually share these case studies because I think it makes a huge difference when um, these are made public and more people have access to such examples. Um, most of the case studies that are taught in business schools are usually male CEOs, and, and that does affect mindsets. I think this is uh, important. So I'm. And the problem is that they always reside within these business schools. They don't. Uh, they don't, they get don't spread exactly. Exactly. Um, uh, Lama, um, because you looked at all these different sectors um, with Sybil, um, what? How do you see? I guess entrepreneurship unlocking. Um, more economic uh, partnerships in, in the region. Yeah, um, uh, I agree with, with uh, my colleagues that uh, uh, partnerships with um, uh, growing partnerships can solve problems of gender inequity in the regional workforce, uh, contributing to social justice through social, institutional and structural change and leading to um, sustainable and um, uh, uh, sustainable and long-lasting ch change. And here I want to um, uh, shed light on uh, an initiative that we launched under the uh, SAWI project, uh, Support and Accelerate Women's Inclusion, funded by the MEPI uh, State Department um, in the U.S. So it is the Gender Lens Investing Initiative, and uh, this initiative is a new investment scheme that has recently emerged at the global level uh, to advance inclusion um, uh, and uh, women's entrepreneurship. Uh, under the GLI, impact investors um, can achieve high returns on their investments. The idea is that they would invest in women-owned and women-led businesses and in uh, employers that or, or organizations that, um, uh, that promote uh, uh, promote women's um, uh, uh, women's economic uh, uh, women's contribution. 
And um, um, so uh, here, investors and employers across the MENA region by implementing, uh, by supporting the gender lens initiative can, um, can um, or by investing through a gender, a gender lens analysis, they have the opportunity to accelerate women's inclusion in the economy. Um, uh, it's an approach that uh, to investing that improves investment pro processes and gives priority to uh, women-owned and women-led businesses and promotes uh, women's entrepreneurship in the region. Uh, and uh, the, the, such an initiative is uh, uh, beneficial for both employers and investors. Uh, for investors, we know that um, uh, organization diversity in organizations uh, lead to better uh, bottom line performance. Um, and for employers, uh, such an initiative attracts investments. Uh, uh, women through such initiatives can get access into new markets, can receive better, fi better financial rates. And this is something that the report, uh, Lean talked about in the report. Uh, it can promote women-owned, women-led businesses. Um, so so I, I, uh, um, uh, I, I want to highlight that initiatives that bring together, together uh, a network, uh, uh, bring a network of uh, investors together and employers together uh, to, to, um, uh, is, is important. And um, it's important to, to also uh, brainstorm about possible solutions, uh, solutions that are driven by the uh, lo localized, I mean, we, we need localized solutions that are driven by the uh, uh, localized uh, uh, data. Um, so. Yeah, and with Sybil, that's exactly what you guys are doing, um, and and um, basically creating new data where it didn't exist in order to localize solutions. Um, I want to just zoom into uh, both Lama and Dr. Faisal for a bit to ask about what sectors you are seeing more entrepreneurship activity. Uh, Dr. Faisal, what are the, the, the sectors that you're seeing more businesses? Um, is it sort of still very feminized sectors? Uh, or are you seeing more um, diversity in some of the sectors? Uh, you might be a bit surprised when I tell you that the ICT sector is the one uh, that we can see uh, a lot of uh, uh, women participating in. Uh, as you can see, uh, the uh, the uh, level, uh, the percentage of graduates or uh, um, of uh, graduates of uh, of STEM girls. Uh, reaches around 40 percent, which is a, a, a way beyond the average uh, uh, globally. And I've noticed this because uh, in my previous work um, uh, in the University of Bahrain, uh, the majority of the classroom uh, in the ICT class uh, in the ICT classroom were uh, young women. Mm -hmm. And these young women, they either uh, decided to go to work in private sector or public sector, and I've seen a lot of them deciding to go and uh, and to uh, become an entrepreneur or uh, or open up a start or start up a business in the ICT sector, and we've seen a lot of it uh, in the even in the fintech bay uh, establishment here in Bahrain. Mm -hmm. So surprisingly, so there is a bit of a shift beyond these feminine, bay, uh, usually uh, mm -hmm. stereotypical. Uh, 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 businesses that uh, women usually open uh, towards more uh, uh, progressive as well as uh, in interesting fields in ICT. Mm, that's that's very good. Uh, very good start for Bahrain, that's for sure. Um, uh, Lama, uh, what are some of the main sectors that you've looked at throughout your surveys? Yeah, so we've looked at um, uh, six sectors, education, uh, financial services, healthcare, professional services, which mm -hmm. includes advertising, marketing, uh, communications, consulting. Uh, we looked at STEM and other services, which includes tourism, food services, hospitality, wholesale and retail trade. Um, uh, we, 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 I mean, uh, the findings indicate that, uh, the findings of the second iteration of the index indicate that education ranks the highest in terms of um, uh, uh, having inclusive recruitment retention promotion policies, mm -hmm. and that STEM ranks the lowest um, mm. uh, in terms of having inclusive recruitment retention promotion uh, policies. 
Um, so a professional services ranks ranks also at the low level um, and other services, um, whereas healthcare ranks at a high level. Uh, uh, and by high scores, I don't mean that the, the, the things are looking very good. No, I mean, th there's still a lot of need for inclusive recruitment, retention, and promotion policies. And there's so much that uh, uh, needs to be done, uh, but education and healthcare fare uh, better than uh, STEM and professional services sectors. We've seen that actually during the pandemic where um, there were job losses and of course primarily uh, women were the ones that were affected, but in education and health in particular, um, uh, a lot of these jobs had to be retained because of, of um, the crisis at hand. Um, so I'm going to just remind the audience to um, uh, submit questions, those of you watching online, to submit questions through the comments or on Twitter. And I'm going to now turn to our in-person audience for questions. I see two questions at the front, but um, I'll first go to David Ottaway. Um, yes, it's, it's on its way. Question is it on? Is it on? Yes. Me? My question is um, really, I guess, a question of methodology. Um, in all these surveys you've been doing, are they limited just to the nationals of the country, or how do you deal with the foreign workers population, which would certainly skew your mm -hmm, you know, inequality definitely. of pay and promotion uh, tremendously? Um, so how do you have you? How do you deal with the foreign populations? No. I think you actually Lynn, uh, Mary Claire, and Lemma can talk about this because yeah. We, we, yeah. yeah, because we were lucky yeah. to have two <laughs> different <laughs> entities that are leading some of this work. Yeah, go ahead, oh, Lynn. Uh, that's a great question, and they do change numbers when we look at uh, local and foreign workers. So in, in our questionnaire, we focus complete in our actual research. We focused on talking to, for example, Bahraini woman, Lebanese woman, the nationality of the country, because we want, we're talking about the country and the condition of Bahraini woman or Lebanese woman in, this, in, the, in, the, in these country. Talking about international or like foreign workers, it's a totally different layer, totally different challenges. It's a different study. So by actually looking into studies that focus on, on local, um, local women and talking to local women, that's how we were able to narrow down the, uh, the information. How do you do it? Uh, we do it similarly. Yeah. We focus on uh, citizens of each country that mm -hmm. uh, we are focusing on. So we included 12 countries in this past wave. And again, we're asking specifically, what do you think about your country where you live now. We do ask, you know, have you moved within the country? Mm. Um, but the, the focus really is on the, the citizens. So you ask about citizenship, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And Lama? Yeah, s same here. I mean, <laughs> we, we focus on female nationals because um, uh, otherwise the results will be skewed. So we, we focus on female nationals in each country. And Dr. Faisal, I assume it's the same uh, when you're tracking some of this uh, data with um, women entrepreneurs? Exactly, exactly. Because uh, as my colleagues has mentioned, <clears throat> uh, when you're talking about uh, uh, foreign workers, it's a different kind of set of challenges mm -hmm. uh, that they set. It's a different set of uh, projects that mm -hmm. they uh, that they uh, go into that are some, uh, sometimes are not aligned or not, uh, or not the same as uh, the nationals. And uh, I would assume also, David, the, um, the data is probably not as available. I know the ILO does a lot of data, but it's very categorized. It's sort of, or comp comp compartmentalized. And yeah. so mm -hmm. um, that is part of the challenge as well. Um, we had another question here in the front. <coughs> Hi. Um, William Lawrence, American University. I've worked in this area for several years at the State Department, including the Global Women's Affairs Office. Um, so I'm coming from a position of 
having worked in this for many years and mm -hmm. frustration, not just needing an explanation as to why <laughs> nurship's important. <laughs> I, I, I agree with everything that was said and everything in the report. I just skimmed the whole report looking for an answer to my question. Okay, so <laughs> in, 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 in m most MENA individuals mm. live in large countries with high male and female unemployment mm -hmm. and the related security issues and big informal economic sectors where 30 to 50% of the population works. And you did get into informal employment here, but, but my question is, uh, and, and, and the context is when I was at MEPI and uh, you know, every time we roll out a women in entrepreneurship program, and I worked on some of these, uh, there's immediately op-eds in the press about why aren't we helping all our unemployed men? Okay, so that's, that's another, another one yeah. of the social <laughs> pushbacks. Yeah, sure. It's not just traditional patriarchy or whatever. It's, it's, it's our real. young men are joining ISIS, right. you know. So, um, so the question is, how do you, um, when you're enabling, right, these young women, how do you do it in a way that sort of enables young women and men together mm -hmm. entrepreneurially? And how do you do it? Um, in a way that moves so much of this informal activity, including in high tech, a lot of these are highly educated people, you know, into formal economics. Because you, until you deal with those big structural questions, your ecosystem's not gonna, not gonna be sustainable enough for larger numbers of people to be in this space and then address these larger social issues. Thank you, yeah. excellent question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> Absolutely, of course. And now we're standing the butter in the head of you. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that um, in order to do so, you have to have a holistic approach to it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we realized back in 2006. Hence, the economic vision 2030. When you're looking to create an ecosystem that fosters both genders, that tries to maintain the quality of life of individuals, you're looking at building that ecosystem and from the prism of where we stand today we look at women empowerment women advancement but then to have a healthy environment you have to foster uh, opportunities on on both genders and in multiple um, sectors and multiple communities where sometimes access becomes very difficult so we've seen that in other countries that have also established their versions of their economic plans or their promises to the world that they'll get there within X amount of years. I think that vision foresight puts you on a trajectory. It's not gonna be 100%, but you will adapt to it as challenges arise. You'll adapt to it as time goes by. So uh, that's, that's our story. Thank, thank you so much, Your Excellency. I, I wanted to also add something to that. We, um, having just completed a project with the U.S. Embassy in Amman, wherein, um, I interviewed um, over 35 entrepreneurs and stakeholders in the ecosystem. Um, and um, there are so many challenges and barriers for entrepreneurs. Like the ecosystem, of course, there are differences. I think many countries in the GCC, because of access to finance, um, are way ahead and they're able to attract others from places like Jordan, Lebanon. Um, um, uh, even North Africa, Egypt in particular, but there are also some good stories there that should be highlighted. Um, uh, the, the networks are still very local, although we're seeing a bit more regional networks, so incubators or accelerators like, um, and now they're actually you know, morphed into fun, uh, a fund like Flat Six Labs was founded in Egypt and then opened um, an office in Tunisia and in Jordan, and now they're stretching out to Iraq. Uh, we just returned um, from um, from Erbil, where you know there is some activity there. But of course, there are, so, as you know, um, um, so many different barriers to it, including um, this skills mitch mismatch. Uh, and uh, you know, Lynn talked about this in terms of the the lack of um, entrepreneurship um, as a path forward, right? As a way of employment as a choice because everybody still wants to go to um, the public sector. Um, it's prestigious, mm -hmm. it's stable, et cetera, et cetera. So I think um, it has to be comprehensive and I'm, um, I'm an advocate of addressing masculinity in MENA societies mm -hmm. because, uh, and I know a lot of the gender-focused programs are starting to actually incorporate that 
And that's a very good start because there are tremendous pressures on young men to provide. Um, the patriarchal system puts so much pressure on young men. Uh, and like you said, and that's how we lose a lot of these men to violent extremist groups. And sorry, I took too long, but no, I, I felt no, the need to also <laughs> respond. But you, please, Lynn, you, others. You covered the, the, the whole <coughs> area and the, and the whole area of com great question. But we were talking earlier about how do we engage men as well with women, uh, with empowering, I know we, we say empowering, but how to supporting women. So that's one of the issues. We still don't have programs in the Middle East. I know I'm overgeneralizing. There might be a program now and there, here and there, on in including men into the cause, into including them, like being part of the cause, which then makes things better because both parties, like, 50 and two fifties of the the full society will be included in changing and creating change. And we also have another, I've seen it firsthand when I was working in Lebanon. Um, I was working in like the tech hub of Lebanon then. I don't know what happened to it now. But uh, <laughs> I've seen women applying and to uh, to accelerate accelerators and all. But you, at the end of the day, only one woman was chosen in compared to 10 men, at mm. least. Why? First of all, the, the, the available groups, are, they don't take her product seriously. Or women are actually going in and afraid to pitch for, full, for like a room full of men. They panic. It's just like, I, c I cannot do this. I, c they don't, I can't relate to them. I don't feel like safe around them. So I can't do this. And I've heard that firsthand. So that's one of the reasons on talk on, on entrepreneurship level of why men are still, there's still more men entrepreneurs than women. They, women, they decide, you know what? I'll use my own money, I'll fund myself, and I will sustain the whole business, but won't grow. And on the informal to formal piece? And uh, informal to formal, it's, uh, in terms of entrepreneurship is mm -hmm. uh, decreasing the barriers into registration and the cost of registration, mm -hmm. which is the bureaucracy of it can be a pain. Not in every country. Uh, Bahrain, they have a new... Oh, there was a problem in Bahrain that they solved, actually. They created a new system where they can actually register online in easy, s simple way. In Lebanon, still complex. In Tunisia, still complex. There are certain countries that, um, that doesn't make it easier for, for people to register their businesses. Some of them have... Uh, in some countries, they will ask for mail to sign with the women, even though it's not legally obligatory. Mm -hmm. But socially, socially, socially mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then women decide, like, okay, I don't want my husband or my father to sign with me or my brother. It's like I'd rather stay informal. So there's a lot of even cultural elements to it. Even if we cover the legal part, there is a lot of cultural and social pressure into staying in the safe area instead of growing or registering and paying taxes and whatnot. Uh, Dr. Faisal or Lama, uh, Mary Claire, do you want to add anything? Um, I would. We, so we do ask a series of questions also about responsibilities at home. And mm -hmm. it is really clear that uh, citizens that have more traditional views of home responsibilities, women should help the children with the schoolwork, men should be in charge of finances. Um, those people are also more likely to have a more gendered view of the workplace as well and think that um, you know, women, men and women should be separated at work, preferences should be given to males. So it really, I do think it's, it's very important to take this holistic approach and to really uh, look at norms at home as well as, mm -hmm. you know, in the workforce. And there's, um, we also have, you know, data on internet usage and how frequently people use it. And the areas that have less accessibility have a greater gender gap. So in cities where internet, internet uh, availability is pretty prevalent, there's really no difference between internet usage mm -hmm. and men and women. Mm -hmm. But the less access you have, the greater the gender differences, which I suspect um, is true generally. So the less access yeah. to uh, VCs, et cetera, the greater gender difference you're going to have. So targeting, like when we're just introducing um, uh, programs for women specifically, if it feels like there's just a dearth of programs mm -hmm. for people in general, mm. there's going to be these, uh, that's also going to 
and gender um, sure. uh, strife, I mm-hmm. guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Faisal, anything to add to? Thank you very much. I'll, I'll do it very quickly. Um, thank you very much for your question. Um, there is a, a beauty in the naming of this committee, the committee that I'm chairing and the, the one that I was just mentioning that is available across all public entities as well as a majority of private entities. It's called the Equal Opportunity Committee. It's not the Women's Committee. It's not the Men's Committee. It's the Equal Opportunity Committee, which, which with, with, with its name, it carries a lot of uh, meaning. It's not just about uh, encouraging women. It's ensuring that these uh, structures and these policies are made to ensure that uh, men and women have equal opportunities in the work for, uh, in the workforce. And as as His Excellency uh, uh, just mentioned, uh, uh, the uh, Bahrain Vision uh, Economic Vision 2030 is based on three pillars: competitiveness, fairness, and sustainability. Fairness is uh, a major pillar in the and uh, uh, in, in this uh, econo- economic strategy. And uh, as my colleague also Lynn mentioned, um, reducing these barriers for entrepreneurs to uh, to enter the market. For example, here uh, here in Bahrain, we have a system for commercial license called Sijilat, uh, which enables people to open up their business from the comfort of their home. Uh, we have the record, the fastest. Uh, uh, a commercial license that was ever uh, ever recorded in this in the system, uh, a person was able to open up a business in 90 seconds, which gives a huge uh, uh, advantage for those who wants to open up businesses, whether men or female. We have uh, Temkin, which is a labor fund in Bahrain that supports men and women to uh, open up their own businesses, to uh, to upskill uh, uh, their skills, reskill, uh, and there are dedicated programs for women to encourage them to uh, uh, to enter the uh, the workforce and to be uh, entrepreneurial. We don't have any quotas in Bahrain. We don't have a quota in Parliament uh, having women in, in Parliament. The women that got uh, elected to Parliament got elected due to their own merits. The, uh, the the women who got promoted and become ministers and become uh, uh, board of directors as well as uh, uh, CEOs, they reach there because of their merits. Uh, their merits. We're not looking for token uh, uh, women uh, on boards just to make sh- just to tick all the boxes for our, for example, foreign investors. Thank you, uh, Lama. Do you have anything to add? Um, well, I, I just want to um, uh, highlight what Lynn mentioned in her re- report in terms of uh, um, um, high rate of uh, I mean, uh, unpaid care work. Um, women are still primarily responsible for child care and, and domestic work, and this is this is was uh, exacerbated uh, uh, by the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, and this uh, reduces women's entrepreneurial chances. So. Um, uh, we need to provide the women with opportunities to to um, to uh, uh, like to, to support women and to, to reform uh, structures and laws so that to, to further support women um, uh, in their ent- entrepreneurial endeavors. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to take one question from our online audience because we're running out of time. Is lack of childcare a barrier for women in the MENA region because the service is too expensive? Or is childcare simply not widely available, or both? And how are countries in the region addressing this issue? All the above. (laughs) So they are actually expensive. Um, In some countries, we uh, we examined that we we came to conclusion that they are even inadequate. So they're not up to the standards and um, unavailable. Not everywhere. There is not enough stuff, enough childcare uh, per per household. I would say uh, expensive and um, not not high level. So and even socially, they ask, "Oh, go put your kid with your mother or something," instead of just taking them to daycare. It's also a social. We're changing now. The Stigma. newer generation, they're changing, but it's taking its time. They rely more on family support. Uh, which is less and less available nowadays. 
Um, how do we do this? Some in Tunisia, they have companies, 40, I think 40 or 50 employees. Uh, I don't have the, ex I forgot the exact number. They are forced to have childcare within premises for, uh, for, for children. So that's a great way. However, a lot of companies are not registered, even though we have we have a high number of employees. So they don't f they're they're not forced to do any of that. That's mm. one. So one one way is by the government to uh, create facilities that are cheap enough for any woman to put their kids in. Because I also heard like if I pay for my kids ch child childcare is more expensive. It's higher than my salary. So why do I do this? So why go, why go to work? Mm. So why start a business? And like a lot of women close their business, especially during the pandemic because of that. They couldn't do both, like family responsibility, uh, working, and then the, the social pressure of being present, fully present with the kids. Mm -hmm. So um, government um, laws can, do, can, can be added to force, um, to force big companies to have childcare. For second, have government uh, child care facilities. Um, I think they, this will help to go to the next mile and then we'll talk about the challenge that they come after mm -hmm. that. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's <laughs> always pushback and then a local solution to the pushback and then more yeah. pushback. It's, yeah, it's, it's a dance, you it's, know? Yeah, it's, a, it's usually an <laughs> ecosystem of, of pushbacks. I'd like to add yeah. really quickly, um, this is a question that will be on our survey. So if you oh. ask me again next year, Excellent. I'll have a much better <laughs> response. <Perfect>. Excellent. <laughs> well, you're invited to do your launch here then, Mary Claire. Um, so final word from our, um, from our uh, panelists. Uh, my question is uh, a little bit more practical. Um, if, if you were to advise a financial institution that has not been um, very forthcoming in giving <laughs> women um, access to finance. Um, how would you do it? What would you say? So, women are 50% of the population. In most countries in the Middle East, they're 53, 55. So, <laughs> yeah, more women, so we right. say 50, just like to cheer everybody. <laughs> so you missing out on a huge population that are very educated. They have the skills, they have the knowledge. They even, with the report, I think the GEM report would say the intention, the entrepreneurial intention is there, but you're not giving them the support. So why are you missing out on this big opportunity mm. to improve your economy, improve <coughs> business, and even improve the social condition in your country? And I always wonder why, <laughs> why not? It's common sense. So uh, it's, um, we need to work towards improving um, the economic condition of women in the region, whether in the workforce, as employees, or as entrepreneurs, because we need to them to be independent entities, because they will be able to create, improve your country, and improve the social and cultural uh, situation around them. So they are a great power, we cannot just let forget that, and we tend to do. Yeah, thank you. Mary Claire? Um, I would say, you know, financial institutions and entrepreneurship, it's about discovering, you know, the next big thing. Uh, everybody's always looking for the next Facebook. <laughs> <is what laughs> mm -hmm. But, and so continually financing just one segment of the population, uh, you're really missing out on innovative ideas that may not occur to you as most um, mm -hmm. people with funding are men. And we see when we're asking opinions about all sorts of different things in society, we are getting these very gendered responses mm -hmm. in some areas. So you are missing out on an opportunity to really target you know, women, catering to women, but also catering to society as a whole by uh, providing a service that men didn't even know they were missing out on. Mm -hmm. That really, so there's just, I think um, women are seen as risky investments, but with risky <coughs> investments comes really big rewards as well. Oh, but right. actually yeah. the return, Good the, just to add that, it's like the return rate, the loan return rate for women, they actually cover the loan more than, more than men mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. So what's risky about that? 
Mm-hmm. That, you're, that, you're getting more on your money back. That's a very good talking point to include. Uh, Dr. Faisal? I would say two words, your loss. <laughs> <laughs> Short and sweet, if yes. If you don't support women, you're, you're as my colleagues has mentioned, you're missing out on um, an important revenue generation opportunity mm-hmm. for your uh, for your entity. So mm-hmm. two words, it's your loss. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, Lama. I would say that women in the MENA region are drastically underrepresented in the workplaces. Um, we in the MENA have the lowest female labor for force participation rate in the whole world. Many parts of our region have exclusionary uh, barriers precluding women's access to work. Uh, and this, this low, very low rate of participation costs the region. Mm. Uh, we lose more business potential due to the low female economic participation mm-hmm. uh, uh, than any other region in the world. So more um, uh, efforts are needed to, to meet those challenges and improve women's economic uh, participation in, in our region. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you um, for attending and for your questions. Uh, Many thanks once again to Ms. Katrina Forovat for joining us today and for His Excellency uh, Ambassador Bahrain Sheikh Abdullah Khalifa. And uh, thanks to all the panelists. And we look forward to continuing the conversation and taking our findings to other fora um, and hopefully get more ideas for another report. (laughs) Thank you again. Thank you.